We light our chalice flame today as chalice flames are lit in our brother and sister congregations across the world. And as I light this chalice, we will hear words adapted from those by Howard Thurman. A candle is a small thing, but one candle can light another. And as it gives its flame to the other, see how its own light increases. Welcome, welcome to this place today. We gather virtually to join as best we can as community together, taking an opportunity to step away from the busyness of life, taking an opportunity to find space to reflect. Today, the 5th of July, is the Sara Puja Day in many Buddhist traditions. It's the anniversary of the very first sermon given by the Buddha and the beginnings of the Buddhist monastic tradition. Now Buddhism is focused on the removal of suffering in this life and beyond. Surely a Unitarian focus too. So I welcome you here today for this time of prayer, of stillness, of music, of reflection, this Sunday service, this space and this time is yours. I bid you all welcome. Our first reading comes from the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. It's a short piece from his collection, Your True Home. And it's a piece on the art of mindfulness. It's an orange meditation. Now it would be neither practical nor simple to follow the meditation right now, but I do encourage you to practice this later, today or perhaps later in the week, when time allows. But this is an orange meditation. Take the time to eat an orange in mindfulness. If you eat an orange in forgetfulness, caught in your anxiety and sorrow, the orange is not really there. But if you bring your mind and body together to produce true presence, you can find that the orange is a miracle. Peel the orange, smell the fruit, See the orange blossoms in the orange and the rain and the sun that have gone through those orange blossoms. The orange tree has taken several months to bring this wonder to you. Put a section in your mouth. Close your mouth mindfully. And with mindfulness, feel the juice coming out of the orange. Taste its sweetness. Do you have time to do so? If you don't think you have time to eat an orange like this, what are you using your time for? Are you using your time to worry? Or using your time to live? The words of Thich Nhat Hanh. Let us come together in a time of prayer. Great Spirit of Life, within our hearts and moving among the stars, we approach with powers and capacities within. We call on the Spirit as we seek truth. 
We call the spirit by following our conscience rather than our passions. We bring the spirit when we receive a blessing gratefully, bear a trial patiently, or encounter peril with courage. Whenever we perform an unselfish deed or lift our hearts in true adoration, we live the Spirit whenever we resist the habits and desires that are in conflict with our highest principles, whenever we speak or act with moral urgency or devotion to duty. May the divine grow within us and our spiritual hopes blend seamlessly with the life we lead. If you wish to, I welcome you to join with me in the words of the last prayer. Following the words on your screen. Eternal Spirit, may we be led from death to life, from falsehood to truth. May we be led from despair to hope, from fear to trust. May we be led from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Amen. Our second reading is by William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian minister and theologian from Boston, who lived and worked in the early 19th century. I call that mind free, which masters the senses, and which recognizes its own reality and greatness, which passes its life not in asking, what it shall eat or drink, but in hungering, thirsting, and seeking after righteousness. I call that mind free, which guards its intellectual rights and powers, and which opens itself to light from wherever it may come. I call that mind free, which does not cower to human opinion which refuses to be the tool of the many or of the few and guards its empire over itself as nobler than the empire of the world. I call that mind free which sets no bounds to its love, which delights in virtue and sympathises with suffering, which recognises in all human beings the image of God and the rights of God's children. I call that mind free, which has cast off all fear but that of wrongdoing, and which no menace or peril can enthrall, which is calm in the midst of the tumults and possessions itself, through all else be lost. The words of William Henry Channel. Now we turn now to our hymn for today. And for those of you who have Green Books, it is number 11 in the Green Book, with words by John Andrew Story. Uh, these are taken, this is a hymn with words taken from the Theravada Buddhist tradition. Um, as I say, it's number 11 in the Green Books, but for the majority of us who do not have Green Books at home, the words will be on the screen. A hymn to perfect wisdom.
It has been, as ever, a strange week. The continued lifting of lockdown has not gone completely smoothly. Our hearts go out to the people of Leicester, facing a spike in infection, and the media's continual switch from extreme caution to apparent total disregard is not making things any easier. If nothing else, this shifting and flexing reminds us of the need to bring our own understandings and feelings to the situation. As Unitarians, we're used to working with ambiguity, but the close need to balance our watchwords of freedom and of reason can, I hope, help us to make decisions in the interests of the wider community, not just ourselves. And our responses, of course, are always personal, but the importance of collective responsibility of responsibility to the collective is an important distinction. Now I mentioned earlier that today is a joyful and a welcome celebration in many Buddhist communities around the world. It is a Sala Puja day, also known as Dharma day. It's the anniversary of the day that Buddha gave his first sermon to five followers in the deer park in Benares. Now it doesn't sound many, five people were there, although that's approximately five more people than I have here in the meeting house with me today. But tradition tells us that the Buddha, having experienced enlightenment himself, had spent eight weeks wandering and wondering what to do with the knowledge. He decided to gather some people he knew and to teach them everything he had learned. Now he taught of the four noble truths. The four noble truths. We don't have time to go into the real detail and underpinning of it, but it's helpful to understand where they're coming from. The thrust of the truths works like this. The first noble truth is the existence of suffering. Recognising that suffering is in the world. It is in ourselves, it is in those we love, it is everywhere. The second noble truth looks to find the cause of that suffering. Now, suffering can come from physical pain, or it can come from spiritual hunger or it can come from unrequited love. However, the key line that Buddhist teaching follows here is that suffering comes from the continued failure to meet our ignorant desires. Now, what we mean by this is that materialism, great wealth, a search for perfection and beauty in the eyes of others, inevitably leads to failure, and failure leads to suffering. Once greed and desire take over our thoughts and our actions, we're trapped in a cycle of non-achievement. There is much we want, and if we gain something, it's never enough. We find ourselves wanting more and more and more. A cycle of suffering. Now the third noble truth, identified by the enlightened Buddha, was that the suffering will end. There are many thoughts and ideas around how this manifests itself, but it points to the possibility that, despite the prevalence of suffering in the world, suffering will come to an end, and can come to an end. And this can apply both in this life and at the end of many, many lives, when an individual themselves reaches the state of nirvana, or enlightenment. Now the fourth noble truth, set out in this sermon, taught this day, 2,500 years ago, near enough, charts the method for removing suffering. And this is recognised by Buddhists as an eightfold path. So we have the four noble truths, and then we go to the eightfold path. 
And that's where the individual is encouraged to live, live their lives the right way, with right understanding, with right thought, with right speech, with right action, with right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And together, these eight ideas make up most of what we do in life. Our hunger for understanding, our hope for the right thought, the need to speak well of others and to others, to act purposefully and in good spirit, to place effort in the right place, to be mindful in all we do, to concentrate on the right things. Deep down, we know this is what we hunger for. Deep down, we know this is how we should live our lives. Now, it was a pretty impressive first sermon. An entire life approach of perhaps billions of people over the years and a spiritual system that he set out in that first sermon. I'm not sure many of us can claim that from our first sermon. Now unsurprisingly, this day celebrates not only the Buddha himself, but Buddhist teaching too. And one of the five congregants that day, one of those became a follower, the first follower of the Buddha. And thus the Buddhist monastic tradition was also born on this day. And so the day celebrates those three elements, the triple gems as they're known, the Buddha, his teachings, and the power of the Sangha a monastic community of followers. So it really is a cause for celebration, to have the guide to life set out so clearly, and with a promise of Nirvana at the end. Now to my mind, there is much in the Buddhist path that speaks truth to my Unitarian faith. It's the undoubted approach of finding an end to personal suffering through good action to others and in your own life that provides that thread of truth that holds good spiritual practice together. Now there is a challenging paradox here that though clear and systemic discipline through clear and systemic discipline in life and in the Buddhist community freedom from suffering might be found. A freedom that can only be achieved through careful and deliberate right action. This methodical approach to our thoughts, our actions, our livelihood, our speech, and many more elements to life could appear to be time consuming and actually spiritual draining. On the face of it, it could even be seen to conflict harshly with that freedom that Unitarians seek. However, I can see on closer review some very strong links of connection between the two. In our second reading, the words of William Ellery Channing, we heard Channing's thoughts on the nature of freedom that a Unitarian might seek. Now Channing was one of the first avowed Unitarians in the United States in the early 19th century, yet his search for freedom sounds very contemporary. He spoke of the many ways in which the mind might be considered free. Channing sought a mind that could master the senses, searching for truth and justice at all times. A mind that does not cower to the opinion of others, that sets no bounds to love. Now I see here a link to the Buddhist Eightfold Path to removing suffering. It's not the same, but then perhaps that's no surprise. But this focus on the need to know your own mind, not to be swayed by the opinions and the temptations of others. This is a crucial part of developing the world where we're working for the greater good of humanity, through a determined effort to live a life of love, both towards ourselves and towards others. Real love, not material gift love. 
to use that love to become the change we seek in the world. So there's an underlying theme here for me of the need to understand and manage our inner selves. To better grasp what makes us tick, what we truly think, what we truly feel. How do we connect to this world? And how committed are we to becoming part of the path to the relief of suffering? Now this could all start to become very heavy. To try to ensure that everything we do, everything we think, every step we take is deliberately calculated to remove suffering could really start to get you down. But it doesn't have to be quite that harsh. Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote the Orange Meditation that we heard earlier, has also written on the need to nourish ourselves with joy and with happiness before embarking on a spiritual path around suffering. In one of his other writings, known as Nourish Yourself, he writes that it's essential we each strengthen our foundations before we move along the path, the Eightfold Path. Now, of course, he's not talking about squandering a load of money on some unnecessary frippery, but instead he's talking about making steps to enjoy a better life, to recognise the value and beauty of our actions and our interactions with the world. That meditation on eating an orange is, for me, and I hope for you, a great example of how to bring joy into our lives. To savour food. To experience the sweetness of the fruit we eat. To reflect on its connection to the earth, the farmers, the weather. How the magic of that sweet orange can be enjoyed. How that very approach can nourish our very souls. Now on this Dharma day, this Asalya Puja, we each have the opportunity to be reminded of the importance of knowing our own mind, of recognising its connection to the wider world, and our connection to the wider community. To understand how the actions we take, how the lives we live, might help to banish suffering for ourselves and for everyone around. Whether Buddhist, Unitarian, Christian or Muslim, Sikh, Pagan, Hindu, Jew or any other, we surely all seek deep down to remove the suffering around the world the best we can. What we learn from this is that through greater understanding of our part in the world, through a right attitude to our actions, our thinking, our mindfulness, our concentration, we can each attain the freedom of mind that we seek, with the relief of suffering so dearly needed in the world. So save a life, nourish yourself, free your mind, and live in mindful connection with the all that is. Let us come together now in a time of stillness and of silence. As we settle our bodies, perhaps closing our eyes, focusing on our breath, I shall speak some words and I shall strike the singing bowl and we'll come together in stillness and quiet together as we settle our bodies.
this Dharma day, we might take time to reflect. To reflect on our own path to relieving suffering in ourselves and in all that we do. To reflect on how we might live more mindfully, more aware of the simple and natural beauty of who we are and what we do. Considering our actions, our thoughts, our approach. The beauty of a mindful life as we come together in stillness and silence. Feel the place you're in. Listen to the noises around you. Find your connection. Nourish yourself. Live and think in beauty.
Spirit of life, we give thanks for your presence, for light and for love, for night and for change. Our worship is over, but our service continues. As we depart, may there be peace among us, now and forever.